Hi, Ben. Where is everybody? <laughs> oh, I still got a couple of minutes. Oh, here comes somebody. Hi, Ambre. Hi, Caleb. Hi, Jaren. It is super windy at my house. All the trees are going nuts out there. I'm going to give it another minute and I'm going to start.
All right, I am going to pick up from where I left off Monday, and that was with um, section 3.3, number nine. Um, we were talking about even and odd functions, and um, an even function is symmetrical with the y-axis, and the odd functions are symmetrical with the origin. It's one or the other, or it's neither. Um, and what you have to do to test it algebraically is you simply um, substitute in our function here um, where the x is. You're going to substitute in a negative x and then simplify this. If it comes out to be exactly what we started with, so if this simplifies to be this, then it's an even function. And when I do simplify it, um, negative x to the fourth really means negative x times a negative x times a negative x times a negative x. Four negatives makes it a positive x. And x times x times x times x is x to the fourth. And then minus seven. And over here, this negative x squared is negative x times negative x. So that's x squared. I finished with exactly what I started with. So this makes it even. And then 11, same thing, determine it algebraically. So you are going to take the ninth root of four, and then in place of the x, you're going to plug a negative x. So what I really have here is the ninth root of four times negative x would be negative 4x. Now, I cannot take the ninth root of an x and I cannot take the ninth root of a four. However, if I were to rewrite my negative four x as a negative one times a four x, and then break it to be the, the ninth root of negative one times the ninth root of four x, you can take the ninth root of a negative one. That is negative one. I cannot take the ninth root of the four x. So negative one times that mess is negative of that mess. And when you plug in a negative x, I can't remember what slide it was. <sighs> Where was it? <laughs> Hello, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? No, that's maximums and minimums. All the way back to the beginning, right here. Um, if you plug in a negative x and you get the exact same function that you started with, that's even. If you plug in a negative x and then you get the negative of the original function, that is odd. That is what happens to me down. Where am I? Here. I started with a, I don't know what color to use. I started with a nine, ninth root of a four X and I ended with a negative ninth root of a four X. That makes it odd. That means that this graph is symmetric to the origin. Okay. Then 14 takes us to the finding the absolute max and the absolute minimum of the function. 
if they exist and identify any local max and local mins. All right, now absolute max means you look at the entire function and pick out the absolute highest point that there is. And in this case, my absolutely highest point is, I wanted to use an orange here, this point right here. It is the highest point on the graph. So this is my absolute max. And it says the absolute maximum of y equals f of x is f of blank equals blank. Remember your x coordinate goes here and your y coordinate goes there. So the three goes here and the seven goes there. And that's my absolute max. Okay, and then the next question says, what's the absolute minimum and the absolute minimum would be my lowest point which would be this guy this is the absolute lowest point on the graph and once again i plug this one in for the absolute min y is equal f of x is f of blank equals blank f of the x coordinate which is one equals the y coordinate, which is two. And then we're still on 14. Um, it says select the correct, correct answer below and if necessary, fill in the answer boxes to complete your choice. Um, three says the local max. Now, when you're looking for the local max, you are looking for where this graph curves. So I have two high points, but only this one increases before it and decreases after it. So this would be a local maximum. When you look at the points, it has to be going up to that point and then going back down away from that point for it to be a local. This point here, doesn't have anything going up to it. It's not a curved part. The only two curved parts are this one and this one down here, the one, two, and that's my minimum. So my local maximum is at three, seven. And then the local minimum would be here because you're going down, you hit this, then you curve back up. So that's considered a local minimum at one, two. So they're both absolutes and they're both locals. Now let's just say for argument's sake that um, this point here had been way down here instead, then this point here would have been my absolute minimum instead of the green one. The green one ends up being my absolute minimum and my local minimum. But if he had been further on down, that blue one, seven, five, then he would have been the absolute minimum. When you're looking for locals, you're looking for where it curves, all right? Like you're on a roller coaster, you're looking for those curves. All right, and that finishes that section. Yep, I'm done. Does anybody have any questions on that stuff now that I finished it up? Oh, and I um, also had somebody the other day had asked me to work one of the problems, it was number nine, I think, and I made a video of it um, and I, I sent an announcement about it. So hopefully you guys saw the announcement about another um, playlist in my YouTube channel. Um, you'll have to go look for it, but it, it'll say Ivy Tech Math 136 and Section 3.2, my math lab problems, I think is what it said. So it's out there now. Okay, so now I want to share this PowerPoint because we're moving on to 3.3. All right. 
3.3, or sorry, 3.4, <laughs> section four. And there's only two objectives in here. Um, we're going to graph functions listed in the library of functions, and then we're gonna graph piecewise functions. And piecewise functions are literally, you got a piece of this, and you got a piece of that, and you put them together to make some funky graph. Like, I could have, you know, a linear function, and then I could have a quadratic function, but maybe I want to put the two together. So maybe like from here to here, I have the line, and then I do the parabola part just from here to here, and it makes that funky shape. I call them piecewise functions. So it's, it's part linear, and then it's part quadratic. And then we'll figure out, you know, from some x value from here to here, it's that. And then from here to here, it's that. So piecewise, a piece of this and a piece of that. But let's start with the different types of functions. Um, and the first one is the constant function. A constant function is a horizontal line. And it is always f of x is equal to some number b. Of course, you might see it like y is equal to 3, or y is equal to negative 8, or f of x is equal to 1, or in this case, f of x is equal to b. It's going through the x axis or the y axis at b. But if I were to label this like one, two, three, let's make this four, five, six, whatever, um, then the function f of x is equal to one, that would be this line right here. Boop. And if I said f of that or y is equal to three, that would be this line right here. And then y is equal to negative eight. Obviously, I'd have to extend this down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Here's negative eight down there. <laughs> and then that line would be right down here. It's a horizontal line, the constant function. Then we have what's called the identity function, which is f of x is equal to x, or you could just say y is equal to x. If y equals x, x equals y, they have the same identity, get it? It's actually the diagonal, the perfect diagonal on a coordinate plane because every point has the same x and y coordinate. Like this is one, one. This one right here would be two, two, three, three. This one down here is negative one, negative one. There's zero, zero. This one here would be negative two, negative two. Down here would be negative three, negative three. They just match. They have the same identity. The X and the Y coordinates are identical. So they call it the identity function. All right. Now, they call this one the square function. Yes, it is a quadratic function, but it is a specific it only has the x squared. It's only in y equals, it only has the x squared. There is no bx plus c, that part's missing. And because it's that, um, the uh, bottom of the parabola sits right on the origin. And then you have mirror images for this point here and that point there. They have the exact same X coordinate. And then their Y coordinates are, well, one and negative one. And they just have mirror images all the way. If you go out to number two, out to two and negative two, then, um, I don't know why they stretched that like that, but they did. Oh, sorry, I labeled that wrong. It's like, what's wrong with this? This is negative two. This right here was negative one, there we go. 
So this is at two, four and negative two, four. So it's a very specific parabola. Moving on, this is the cube function. This is y equals x cubed and it has an S kind of a shape to it. And it goes through the origin and it also has the specific points of negative one, one, zero, zero, and one, one. Those are very specific points to that function. But it's got that kind of an s -y shape to it, going through negative one, negative one, zero, zero, and one, one. Okay, next is the square root function, which I just call it the function, because it's like the sound effects for you. <laughs> it just kind of goes off on its own but it starts at the origin and then it goes off like that. Just like, um, yeah, that's, that's what it is. The reason it's only in quadrant number one is because X cannot be negative. You can't take the square roots of negatives. So there is no X coordinates that are negative. So that's why you've got nothing over here. The entire graph is in the first quadrant. And then the next function in the family is the cubed root function, which kind of looks like the x cubed, except it got flipped twice. It got flipped around the y and around the x because the cubed function, the x cubed, um, goes something like this. So if you, if you flip that vertically around the y-axis, then the graph would be doing this, something like this. And then they rotated it, so they did that, and then, did that, and then they rotate it 90 degrees, yeah, 90 degrees to the left. Oh, yay. And then 90 degrees to the left lands it, like this, this comes down here and this goes up there. So it lands on it like that. So there's similarity to it between the X cubed and the cubed root, but the original was the blue and the original X cubed was the yellow. And I did a horrible job of drawing them, but they actually are symmetric around that diagonal right there, which they consider that the origin, which makes it an odd function. All right, next, the reciprocal function. This one's funky. Um, there's mirror images, but it's in only two quadrants. Quadrant one up here, make that bigger and make this go faster. Here we go. Quadrant one and quadrant three. Um, whatever you pick for X, it'll be in the denominator. So if X is one, Y is one, cause that's one over one. If X is two, then you'll get one over two. So if X is two, Y is one half. But if you pick X is one half, you get one over one half, which is really one divided by one half, which is really one times two over one, which is two. And that's this point right here. Um, as X gets bigger, as X gets bigger, this graph keeps getting closer and closer and closer to the X axis. And as X gets smaller, one half, one third, one fourth, you know, you're going to get closer and closer and closer to the Y axis. They actually call those asymptotes, if you've ever heard that word before. I have a great magnet in my office that says, kiss my asymptote. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Anywho, and then it has its mirror image over here doot, on the other side. But they call that the reciprocal function. 
and you can see that I did do a reciprocal thing over here. So, and how many more are in this family? Two more, maybe three more. Um, then there's the absolute value function. And this one's always the shape of a V. Um, Cause if it was just Y is equal to X, earlier we had f of x is just equal to x and that was this one right here it was this diagonal it was the identity function but that allowed you to go down into quadrants um quadrant three by putting an absolute value around this that makes all of your y coordinates positive so this piece right here ends up going up into quadrant one and you get this perfect V. And then, oh, this last one, the greatest integer function. Um, there's only one problem at the very end and we don't even really need to understand this math speak right here. I just wanna show you what it looks like. Um, it's an interval thing. Um, it's a graph that looks like this. And the best explanation I can give you for where a graph would be used like this, and um, they'll give you one in an example later, but um, in business, of course, in business problems, you're only in quadrant one because that's where all the positive values are. But let's say you work for a furniture store and you get paid, you know, to work there, but you also work on commission or maybe a closed store. I don't know. And they will give you a bonus based on a range of, of values. So maybe these, this one and two and four, you know, along the X axis and Y axis, maybe that's thousands of dollars. So maybe you sell like $2,000 worth 2000, we'll say, let's say you told, you sold $2,000 worth of, um, the way this is left listed here, this is one, this is two. So from here to here, this would be anybody who sold between one and $2,000 worth of furniture. And then maybe this is, you get a $100 bonus. So anybody between one and 2,000 gets a $100 bonus. And somebody over here between four and five, which would be here and here, that's between four and five. If you sold between four and five, maybe they give you a $400 bonus, however they do that. So it's a range of things. I call that the greatest integer function. Okay, so um, you might wanna keep some of these handy, you know, these pictures here. If I had been on the ball, I would have put them all on one slide and I didn't as a handout to you. Sorry, maybe I can do that later and add it into my math lab um or into my um modules because when you get to the first one my math lab number one it says match each graph to its function and down here it says drag your answers to the correct position so you're gonna have to click on you literally click on this right here and then drag it to one of these empty boxes and you're looking for the square root function and the square root function look like like that. And that one is this one right here. So the square root function, I'm just going to color code it for you would go right there. Next is the reciprocal function. Remember the reciprocal that's one over X and that is this one here. It does this. That's the reciprocal function. Here, I highlight this one in green. Uh, next, next we have the absolute value function and that is the V, which is this one. So absolute value function, you'll drag there. And then we got the constant function. Remember, constant is just a horizontal line, and that is this one. So I would drag it there. And what's next? The cubed root function. How about purple? 
the cubed root function. Now the cubed root, don't get it confused with the cube. The cube root is this one. It's kind of on its side. That's the cubed root one. Not to be confused with the, where's the cube? The cube function, this one is this one here. That's the cube function. So cube goes up and down, whereas the square function lays on its side like that. Or not, the cube root function. I said square, I meant cube root. All right, the square function, that's your parabola, and that's this one here. So I'm gonna shade that one in. I wasn't shading, was I? Shame on me, I meant to shade. Make it a little bit more clear of what the heck I'm doing up here. And then you only have one left. <laughs> so by default, we know which one that is. Uh, I can't remember what color I picked there. That doesn't look right, but whatever. Um, so the identity function is simply the, that main diagonal function on the coordinate grid. So in my math lab, you gotta click and drag. You don't have to do what I'm doing. All right, so another one like that. Uh, it's all the same pictures, except they scrambled them up at the top just to make you practice again. So the square root function, that goes like that, and that is this one. Boop. Then I've got the constant function. Constant function is a horizontal line that's right here. So here's my constant function. Then we've got the absolute value. Absolute value is the V. So that's this one. Then I've got the cube function and that's X cubed. So it looks like this. Remember, you're x cubing it. So when you cube a number like two cubed is eight, three cubed is 27, four cubed is 64, it gets big fast. So it shoots, it's shooting straight up. All right, it's getting big fast. That's why it's going up like this. But when you do the cubed root function, the cubed root, it gets smaller. So that's why it's lying flat, because you're cube rooting it. And then what else we got here? We got the reciprocal function. The reciprocal function is the one that looks like this, you know, on the opposite sides. That's this one here. It's a reciprocal. And then we've got the square function, that's my parabola, which is right here. And last but not least is the identity function. I guess I'll just use black on that. Identity, and that's just that main diagonal right here. It's this one. So there's a couple of those. Questions on that? You're just identifying the functions Okay, what did I just do? There we go. <laughs> I don't know what I did. This moved something. Next. All right. So I did that. All right, graph the function. Be sure to label three points on f of x equals x. So they are doing the identity function, which just means whatever x is, that's what y is. So if x is 0, y is 0. If x is 1, y is 1. If x is 2, y is 2. Now when you click on this graph, you only need two points to connect the dots. 
So I would pick a point, I go with zero, zero, and then maybe I picked two, two. And then I'm gonna grab my ruler. I love this little feature, very cool. Makes me draw straight lines every time. Drawing my line. There it is. It's a miracle. So, uh, seven. Graph the function. When I'm looking at this function, this one is the reciprocal function. So I'm looking for it, C, because it's in quadrants one and three. D has it in quadrants um, two and four. This would be negative one over X. So any questions on that and what they want you to do in that first part? Because the next part's the piecewise functions and those are fun. Not the thing that we aren't already having enough fun as it is. Nothing, we're good? No questions. Okay. Piecewise, piecewise functions. Okay, they look like this. <laughs> it says f of x is equal to, and they actually have three pieces here. It could be, I need to make that smaller. Oot. Negative at negative two x plus one if your x coordinates are between negative three and one, and then f of x would just equal two if you have just the x coordinate of one, and then f of x equals x squared if you have x coordinates greater than one. So, the green one is a linear function. The pink one is a constant function. And the blue one, that is your squared function. But you don't want the entire function. You only want a piece of it. So like, for example, the, um, the x squared, you know, it looks like this. But depending on where x is one is, well, actually, I do know where that is because this is at zero, zero. So one would be like right here. They only want the x's that are greater than one, which means you're only looking at this portion right here. You would erase the rest. This would all be gone. You'd be only looking at that blue part. And then the pink one is a horizontal function, right? It goes, here's my x, y axis, here's two. And I've got a pink line going through the y axis at two, except they only want the piece of the graph where x is equal to one. So here's one. They literally only want this one point right there. So you would actually erase the rest of the line. And then for the green one, that is a line. If you remember how to graph lines, it has a y intercept of one, right? That's my y intercept. So it crosses here. And then it has the slope of negative two. So for every Two, you go down, you go over one, down two, over one. So that would be the entire line. But they only want it from negative three to one. One, two, three. So negative three would be right here, and one would be right there. So for this one, they only want from here to here. You would erase the rest of this and the rest of that. 
So you would have to put those three, if I, if I took all three of these and put them on top of each other, I'd be piecemealing it together. I'd be putting it together. So I'd have that green graph and then I'd have this point right here would be at one. I'd have that point sitting right there. And then the blue curve uh, is one, one, which would start one, one would start right here and would go like that. So my picture would be a line coming, come on, a line coming down. Then I'd have this dot up here and then I'd have my curve, my curve going something like that. It's a piecewise, you're putting it together. Now, this question, I got A through F here. Um, I just kind of left the slide if, oh, here's the picture. Yeah, there's the picture. There's the final picture. This is the green part. <laughs> this is the green part they wanted right here. Beep. And then this is that pink dot. And, and then this was the blue. I did a pretty good job with my picture. But they asked you a series of questions. Um, they wanted you to find f of negative two, f of one, and f of two. Well, in order to find those, you have to look at what x coordinate they're giving you and then pick the right function that contains that x. So when they say f of negative two, I need to find where would negative two be located? Would it be here, here, or here? Well, negative two is between negative three and one. So I'm gonna have to use this function. So I'm gonna calculate f of negative two equaling negative two times negative two plus one. I would, I would substitute it into this function right here. And then negative two times negative two is positive four and positive four plus one is five. And I think that's what they show in this next slide. Yep, there it is. F of negative two equals negative two times negative two plus one, which is five. So that was the first one. Now, when you go to do the next one, they said calculate F of one. So remember that's your X coordinate. This is the only one, this is the only one that has one in it. It says X equals one. So the answer is flat out of two. It's just two. And if I look at the next slide, there it is. F of one equals two. And then the third one wants you to calculate F of two. And two would fall into this one right here. X is greater than one because two is greater than one. So I'm gonna plug that into my X squared. So, f of two is going to equal two squared. I'm plugging and chugging into the purple one. And so the answer is four. And if I look at the next page where they showed their work, there it is. f of two equals two squared, which is four. So you have to be careful which, which piece of the function you pick based on whatever X coordinate they give you. And then they'll tell you from here to here, we want these X's. And then from here to here, we want these X's. And from here to here, we want those X's. And I think the most you'll have is two and three piece, piecewise functions. I don't think you have any that are four, but I could be wrong. Okay, so that was question A, boop. And then question B says, determine the domain of the function, remember the domain is all your x's, and I can look 
at this. I'm going to have to erase all my color here to show you what I'm talking about, but um, I can see that this thing starts at negative three, goes from negative three up to one here, but doesn't include it. On the next one, it includes the one. And then on this one, it goes from one and keeps going to infinity. So my domain would be a bracket negative three to infinity if they want it in interval notation. If they just want um, inequality, you would just simply say that x is greater than or equal to negative three. So let me go to the next slide after that. Where is it? There they are. X is greater than or equal to negative three. And here it is in interval notation, negative three to infinity. So that takes care of part B. Now C wants you to find intercepts. Intercepts. Um, remember an intercept is where it crosses an axis. So here's my x and y axis. If I had a function that looked like that, it crosses the x in two place and the y in one. Anywhere on the y axis, the um, x coordinate is always zero. So this is going to be zero and then some number y. For your x-intercepts, it's some number x and y is zero. And I, I've got two of them here, so I'll label it x sub one and x sub two. Um, now, <laughs> you have to uh, look again, if you're looking for the y-intercept, that's where x is zero. So I'm gonna come back up here to where it talks about the x's and figure out where zero would be located. Is, would it be this one? Is zero greater than zero? Sorry. <laughs> Is zero greater than one? No. Is zero equal to one? No. Is zero between negative three and one? Yes. So I have to use this function. When x is zero, the y coordinate will be negative two times zero plus one, which is zero plus one, which is one. So that's my y-intercept. Now, to find the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts is when f of x is zero. And I've got three functions here. So I have to consider all three. So I'm gonna start with zero equals the first one, negative two X plus one. I'm gonna consider this one first. That's this one. Then you have to consider the next one, which would be zero is equal to two. The next function here is just the, is just the two. And then you have to consider the last one, which would be zero equals the x squared, which is this one. Now the one in the middle makes no sense because zero does not equal two, so that one's out. Here, I would, I would actually add two x to both sides. Bada bing, bada boom. So I get two x is equal to one, and then I would divide by two. So there's one of them, one half comma zero. However, I got an x value of one half for that function. I have to make sure, make sure that this one half right here is in this um, interval. Does one half fall in between negative three and positive one? Yes, it does. So this is definitely an answer for one of my x-intercepts. And this is my y-intercept over here. 
And the only other one I have to solve is this one in the middle here, zero equals x squared. Um, if you wanna solve zero equals x squared, I would square root both sides and I get x is equal to zero. Now the problem with that is when you say x is equal to zero, that came from the green function, right? This x squared is only good for x is greater than zero. This says equal to zero. This one's out also. So I should only have two intercepts for part C. Zero, one, and one half, zero. And let's see what their part C says. Dun, da, 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 dun, da, da, da. The y-intercept is... The y-intercept is right there, did they label it? F of zero equals one, so zero, one. And then my x-intercepts are gonna be, and you can see down here they did all three of them. They let F of x be the two x plus one, there's the two, and there's the x squared. Those are the three that I did on the previous page. Um, that makes no sense, so that's no solution. Um, x equal to zero, this said x was greater than zero, so that one's out. This would be the only one that works because it's within this range. And, and they didn't label it. I guess this is just the answers here. Hmm. Okay. And what else do they want us to do on this problem? Oops. Uh, graph it, then use the graph to find the range, and then is F continuous? Okay, so D, here's the graph. I already talked about that. They wanted to know the range. Now the range goes from low point to high point. And when I'm looking at this, the lowest point on the graph is right here, but it doesn't include it because it's an open circle. So that's at negative one. So I would need a negative one comma. And then the highest point is infinity. So my range should be negative one to infinity. That's part e, there it is, negative one to infinity. And then it says, uh, is this graph continuous? No, it's not because there's a jump in the graph at x is equal to one. A continuous function is a function where you could put your pen down and draw on it and never, you could follow it and never have to pick up your pen. But on this one, I'm, drawing down to here, but then I have to pick up my pen and jump to the pink dot, pick up my pen again and jump to this open circle so that I can then draw my arrow going like that. It's not continuous. There's lots of breaks in the action. All right, so that's the lecture part of this. And now I'm gonna go through some of my math lab examples. Unless you got a question you wanna interrupt me with. All right, so number eight says, if f of x is defined as follows, find a f of negative three, b f of zero, and c f of four. Okay, f of negative three, we are looking for where x would be. Negative three is less than zero. So I'm gonna use the x squared function. So for part A, <clears throat> f of negative three is gonna equal negative three squared, which is nine. So that's the answer there. That's all the blue. I'm using the blue function on that. Then we got part B. And part B wants you to calculate 
f of zero. That's it right here. X is equal to zero. When X is equal to zero, Y is zero automatically. So all I have to do is put zero right here. And then the last one is F of four. F of four, four is greater than zero. So I'd have to use this function to get this answer here. So for part C, this is just zero. C, I would have F of four equals two times four plus four. There and there. So two times four is eight and eight plus four is 12. And that's what's going right there. Do you understand what I'm doing? It's looking good. Okay. All right, next is number 10. Um, let's see. The function f is defined as follows. You're going to have negative 3x plus 4 for all of your x's that are less than 1. And then you'll switch to the function 4x minus 3 for x's that are greater than or equal to 1. And then they ask you four questions. First, find the domain of the function. The domain of the function is what your x's are. The x's for this first one are all less than 1. And then these are all greater than or equal to 1. Maybe if I drew a number line, you could visualize this a little better. Here's one, right? Use brighter colors. If I wanted X is less than one, that would be like an open circle or a parenthesis going this way. But then if you wanted X is greater than or equal to one, you'd put, you'd fill in the dot and then go this way. I've just covered the entire x-axis. So my domain, which down here they said put it in interval notation, would be from negative infinity to positive infinity. It's covering the whole thing. Then it says locate any intercepts, select the correct choice below. Okay, well, y intercepts are when x is zero. So which one of these contains x is zero? That would be this one. Zero is less than one. Zero is not greater than or equal to one. Zero is less than one. So I would have to use this function to find the y-coordinate. So to find the y-intercept here, I would take negative three times the zero plus four, which is zero plus four, which is four. So my y-intercept is zero comma four. That's my first one. Now to find the x-intercepts, the x-intercepts are when um, y is zero. Okay, so because I'm putting y is zero, I'm gonna have to put the zero here for both functions. So first I have to do the zero equals the negative three x plus four. Let me move this over a little bit. First I have to do the zero equals negative three x plus four 
And then I have to do the zero equals 4x minus 3. I got to solve them both for the x and then make sure that that value of x falls within the specified uh, x is less than 1 or x is greater than or equal to 1 situation. So on this one, I would add 3x to both sides cancels out there. So I get 3x on the left equals 4 on the right. And when I divide by 3, I get 4 thirds. That's actually 1 and 1 third. Now that one came from the top one, the negative 3x plus 4. Um, let's see. This came from the top one. I have to check, can, can x equal one and one third? No, x has to be less than one. One and one third, not less than one, so I can't use that one. Now let's check the other one. I would add three to both sides. That cancels out. I get three is equal to four X. And when I divide off the four, I get three fourths. Now that one is to this X value here, which is a three fourths, you have to compare it here. Is three fourths greater than or equal to one? No, damn it, that one doesn't work either. I don't have any X intercepts in this function only the y-intercepts. I only have one answer that I can put in here and that was the zero four. So the one I did previous, you know, their example, one of the x-intercepts checked and the other one didn't. This one, neither of them worked. And then you might have a problem where they both work. Or maybe you might have three x-intercepts, you know, it depends on how many functions they give you. This was a two-piece function. Okay, and then C says graph the function. Okay, it is multiple guess. Um, I put up here, uh, right here, I just kind of added this in here so that I could have it on the page. All right, the first one, let's see, this was the green one, and this one was the pink one. Now, I hope you guys remember how to graph lines. Um, you can either use the y-intercept. Well, I can't have the entire line. That's the problem. So a lot of people like to use the y equals mx plus b method, but then you draw the line across the whole paper, and then you're like, okay, I got to go back and erase some of this. So what I like to do is it only takes two points to connect the dots, but I usually do three just to make it good. And for the pink one, I have to choose X's that are less than one. Well, the very next number that is less than one is actually point nine 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 nine. And I can't graph that. So I'm actually going to start with the number one and then I'm going to go less than that and I'll go zero and negative one. You can choose fractions if you want, but I'd much rather plug and chug whole numbers and you're going to plug and chug those whole numbers into, into this X right here. So you're going to calculate negative three times one plus four, negative three times zero plus four, negative three times negative one plus four. So when I calculate this one, which is negative three times one is negative three plus four is one. Then I'll plug in zero. Negative three times zero is zero plus four is four. And then I'll plug in negative one. I'm just doing this verbally. Negative three times negative one is three plus four is seven. So when I go to graph this thing,
Okay, so my points are gonna be one, one would be here, but that has to be an open circle. Zero, four is here. Negative one, seven would be there. And then the line would actually start at the open circle and keep going in this direction. That is the pink one right there. Now, I'm going to do the same thing with the green one, except I have to pick different values for X. Um, X has to be greater than or equal to one. So I'm going to pick one, two, and three. These are the X coordinates I'm going to choose but I have to plug them into this X where I'm highlighting in green, plug and chug there. So four times one is four, minus three is a one. Four times two is eight, minus three is a five. Four times three is 12, minus three is a nine. Now this time, when I go to graph it, the first point, one, one, that is gonna fill in this dot right here at one, one. It's gonna fill it in. So I might as well just make it black. Boop. And then two, five over two, five would be here. And then three, nine is way up here somewhere. And that goes like this. And of course, that's my green line. And that's what my function should look like. So I can automatically eliminate A and B because they have big old gaps between the two lines. These two lines connect at 1, 1. Now C and D look pretty darn close. You're probably going to have to click on the little um, magnifying glass to get a really good look at this. But I also want you to notice that they're labeled 10 by 10 grids. And that means that this, each one of these lines is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So you're looking at 1, 1. 1, 1 should be dead in the center of one of these little squares, which that one looks like it is, and so does this one. But the y-intercept, where it crosses the y-axis, it was 0, 4. So the answer to part B is going to help me determine part C, and I'm looking for the one that crosses it at 0, 4, that would be this one here. Here's my y-intercept, zero, four. This one here looks a little less than four. It looks like at three. So it's D. And then it says, based on the graph, find the range. Remember the, the range is how it is placed vertically. So you're looking for the lowest point which would be right here. And that lowest point is at one. And it includes the one because I, I had to bubble in the dot there when I did the green part. And then it keeps going up, so it goes to infinity. So it's choice. Oh wait, I'm sorry. A says the range does not have any isolated values that can be described. Oh yeah, I was right, sorry. <laughs> Uh, there we go. Include the one and go to infinity. When they say um, the range has a set of at least one isolated value, that would be like this picture back here. This right here, that where that pink dot was, that's an isolated value. Um, so anyway. This wasn't isolated. One to infinity. Choice A. 
All right, 12. 12 says the graph of a piecewise function is given. Write a definition of the function that best describes this graph. Okay, they want you to type the left piece of the function and the left piece of the function would be this piece. And they want that all within here. And then they want you to do the right piece of the function, which would be this piece over there. And they want you to fill all this in. In my math lab, I took a screenshot of the actual printed out homework, so I've got lines, but in my math lab, you'll have your usual little, you know, boxes to fill in. Okay, now they want to know what the function is. So you've got to look at the function and decide what they are. The pink one is definitely a line. It's a linear function. It crosses the y-axis. If, if I were to extend this out just to you know, get the whole line, I can see it crosses the y-axis at zero. So for that one, the pink one, b is zero. And what is the slope? It looks like you're going up one and one to the left, up one and one to the left, up one and one to the left. So the slope is negative one. So in a mx plus b explanation, this would be a negative invisible one x plus zero. I wouldn't put plus zero because you know, it's a waste of time. So that's the pink one, negative x. Now, where does that go? It goes from, um, uh, uh, how about gray? It goes from here to here, which is from negative three to zero. So I would put the negative three here and the zero there. And then the green one, if I were to extend the green line, you know, out, this too also crosses at the, on the y-axis at zero. So B is equal to zero. And then this one looks like it goes up one, two, three over one, two to find another point on the line. So my slope there is up three over two, two thirds. So, and this can barely be able to see it in here. So this is gonna be two thirds X plus zero. So it's just two thirds X. And then where does it go to? It goes from here, which is zero. I erase the line again, to here which is at two. So this one goes zero to two. And that's that. Hope that's making sense. I love being able to use color. I learned this crap on a chalkboard. <laughs> that's how old I am. Now ask me, what's a chalkboard? Don't ask me that question. All right, here's another one. Uh, write a definition for the function. Okay, um, now they started us with negative two. This one says negative two is less than or equal to x is less than or equal to what? Negative two on this graph is right here, right? That's negative one negative one, negative two, that's where negative two be located. So we're going from here to here. That's this line. So it's going from negative two to zero. And then the other one starts at the, it just says X is greater than or equal to, 
because it starts right here, right? And keeps going and going and going, it never finishes. So it's starting right here at zero and then keeps going to infinity. So X is greater than or equal to zero. So that fills in those parts. Now I need the equations of the lines. Well, um, for the blue one, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this. <clears throat> Um, for the blue one, if you were to extend it, you can see it's crossing the y-axis at 2. So for the blue one, b is equal to 2. And then the slope is up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1. m is up 1 over 1, also known as 1. So if I put it in the y equals mx plus b form, it's a 1x plus 2. And then if I look at the other line, I need the equation of this line. This one's crossing the y-axis at 0 and up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, up one. This one also has a slope of 1. So it's just one X or just X. That's the um, identity function right there. And that's 13. And I got two minutes, I can make it. We got one last example. Okay, it says the postal service of a country charges 39 cents postage for a letter weighing, it's 39 cents for a le letter weighing up to one ounce. That means between zero and one ounce, they're gonna charge you 39 cents. But then they're going to add on to that 22 cents for each additional ounce up to, 50, up to five ounces. So they're just gonna take this and they're going to add on 0.22 cents each time they do this. They just keep adding 0 0.22, 0 0.22. So 0 0.39 plus 0.22 gives me 0 0.61, 61 cents. Add another 22, you get 0 0.83. Add another 22 cents, it's a dollar five. Add another 22 cents and it's 1.727. Now, when I look at my pictures down here, those are the right numbers and those are the right numbers. Those are not the right numbers, so it's not B or C. And it's a flat rate, so anywhere between 1 and 2, it's 0.61. That would be a horizontal line. So this one has these slanted lines, so it's not that one, it's A. That's a constant rate. It's 61 cents for 1.1 ounces, 1.2 ounces, 1.3 ounces, they're all 61 cents, so it's, it's straight across. And now I am done. Anybody have any questions? You've been a lovely audience. Tip your waitresses. If you're living at home, that would be your mom. If you don't got any questions, I'm done. No questions. All right. See ya. Adios. Noah, did you uh, Noah, did you um, see my announcement where I posted that question for you? Number nine in my YouTube channel. Noah. <laughs> Noah, are you asleep? Bye, Noah. Check YouTube.